Chapter 36, the 13th kill. Goddard was in the chapel sanctuary, finishing the last of his terrible business. Outside, the wails began to fade as Rand and Chomsky finished what they had begun. A building was burning across the courtyard. Smoke and cold air poured in through the broken stained glass windows of the chapel. Goddard stood at the front by an altar that featured a shining two-pronged fork and a stone bowl of dirty water. There was only one tonist left light in the chapel. He was a balding man wearing a frock that was slightly different from the dead around him. Goddard held him with one hand and wielded his sword on the other. Then Goddard turned to see Rowan and smiled. Ah, Rowan, just in time, he said cheerily. I've saved the curate for you. The tonist curate showed defiance rather than fear. What you've done here today will help our cause, he said. Martyrs testify far more effectively than the living. Martyrs to what? Goddard sneered and tapped his blade against the huge tuning fork. To this thing? I'd laugh if I wasn't so disgusted. Rowan strode closer, ignoring the carnage around him, focusing in on Goddard. Let him go, Rowan said. Why, do you prefer a moving target? I prefer no target. Finally, Goddard understood. He grinned as if Rowan had just said something charming and quaint. Does our young man express a wee bit of disapproval? Volt is dead, Rowan told him. Goddard's gleeful expression faded, but only a bit. He was attacked by the Tonus? They'll pay dearly for it. It wasn't them. Rowan didn't even try to hide the animosity in his voice. He gleaned himself. This gave Goddard pause. The curate struggled in his grip, and Goddard slammed him against the stone basin hard enough to knock him out, then let the man fall to the ground. Volta was the weakest of us, Goddard said. I'm not entirely surprised. Once you're ordained, I will happily have you take his place. I won't do that. Goddard took a moment to gauge Rowan, to read him. It felt like a violation. Goddard was in his head, even deeper in his soul, and Rowan didn't know how to cast him out. I know you and Alessandro were close, but he was nothing like you, Rowan. Believe me, he never had the hunger. But you do. I've seen it in your eyes. I've seen how you are when you, are, when you train. You live in the moment. Every kill is perfect. Rowan found he couldn't look away from Goddard, who had put his sword down and how held his hand out as if he were inviting the embrace of a savior. The diamonds in his robe twinkled in the faraway firelight, so bedazzling. We could have been called reapers, Goddard said, but our founders saw fit to call us scythes because we are the weapons to mankind's immortal hand. You are a fine weapon, Rowan, sharp and precise, and when you strike, you are glorious to behold. Stop it. That's not true. You know it is. You know we're, you were born for this, Rowan. Don't throw it away. The curate began to moan and groan, beginning to regain consciousness. Goddard hauled him to his feet. Glean him, Rowan. Don't fight it. Glean him now and enjoy it. Rowan tightened the grip on his blade as he looked into the curate's bleary, half-conscious eyes. Even as he tried to stand his ground, Rowan couldn't deny the power of the undertow. You're a monster, he shouted. The worst kind, because you don't just kill. You turn others into killers like yourself. You just lack perspective. The predator is always a monster to the prey. To the gazelle, the lion is a demon. To a mouse, the eagle is evil, eagle is evil incarnate. He took a step closer. The curate still held tightly in his grip. Will you be the eagle or the mouse, Rowan? Will you soar or will you scurry away? For those are the only two choices today. Rowan's head was swimming. The smell of blood and the smoke pouring in through the shattered windows made him dizzy and muddled his thoughts. The curate looked no different than the strangers he'd practiced on every day, and for a moment he felt himself out on the lawn in the middle of the killcraft exercise. Rowan unsheathed his sword and stalked forward, feeling the hunger, living in the moment, just as Goddard had said, and allowing himself to feel that hunger was freeing in a way that Rowan couldn't describe. For many months he had trained for this, and now he finally understood why Goddard always let the last one go before Rowan could strike, stopping him one short blow of completion. It was to prepare him for today. Today he would finally have that completion, and every day henceforth when he went out to glean, he would not stay his hand or his blade or his bullet until there was no one left to glean. Before he could think it through, before his mind could tell him to stop, he launched forward towards the curate and thrust his blade forward with all of his force, finally achieving that exquisite completion. The man gasped and stumbled aside, the blade having missed him completely. Instead, Rowan's blade hit its true mark. 
and ran scythe Goddard through, all the way to the hilt. Rowan was close to Goddard now, inches from his face, looking into his wide, shocked eyes. I am what you made me, he told Goddard, and you're right. I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that more than anything I've ever done in my life. Then with his free hand, Rowan reached down and yanked the ring off Goddard's finger. You don't deserve to wear this. You never did. Goddard opened his mouth to speak, perhaps to deliver an eloquent death soliloquy, but Rowan didn't want to hear anything from any more. As he stepped back, he withdrew his sword from Goddard's gut and swung it into him with a broad, sweeping arc that took off Goddard's head in a single blow. It tumbled and landed in the basin of dirty water, as if that were the basin was for. The rest of Goddard's body fell limply to the ground, and in the silence of the moment, Rowan heard from behind him, What the hell did you do? Rowan turned and saw Chomsky standing at the entrance of the chapel with Rand beside him. You are so gleaned when he's revived. Rowan let his training take over. I am the weapon, he told himself. And in that moment, he was the lethal one. Chomsky and Rand defended themselves against him, and although they were good, they were nothing compared to a weapon so sharp and precise as he. Rowan's blade cut Rand deep, but she kicked the sword out of his hand, and with a well-placed Bokatar kick, Rowan responded with an even more effective kick that broke her spine. Chomsky set Rowan's arm ablaze with the flamethrower, but Rowan rolled on the ground, putting it out, then grabbed the toning mallet from beside the altar and brought it down on Champs Chomsky like the hammer of Thor, striking again and again and again as if he were toning the hour until the curate grabbed his hand to stop him and said, That's enough, son. He's dead. Rowan dropped the mallet. Only now did he allow himself to let his guard down. Come with me, son, the man said. There's a place for you with us. We can hide you from the side of them. Rowan looked at the man's outstretched hand, but even now Goddard's words came back to him, the eagle or the mouse. No, Rowan would not scurry away and hide. There was still more that had to be done. Leave here, he told the man. Find the survivors if there are any and get out, but do it quickly. The man looked at him for a moment more, then turned and left the chapel. Once he was gone, Rowan picked up the flamethrower and got to business. Out on the street, fire trucks had already pulled up and peace officers were holding back crowds. The entire cloister was now on fire, and although firefighters raced towards the blaze, they were intercepted by a young man stepping out of the main gate. This is a scythe action. You will not intervene, he said. The fire captain who now approached him has heard of scythe-related fires, but never had such a thing happened on his watch. There was something about this that didn't seem right. Yes, the boy appeared to be wearing a scythe robe, a royal blue one studded with diamonds, but the robe clearly didn't fit him. With flames consuming the compound at an alarming rate, the captain made a judgment call. This kid, whoever he was, was no scythe and was not about to hinder their efforts. Out of the way, he told the kid dismissively. Get back with the others and let us do our job. Then the kid moved with lightning speed. The captain felt his legs kicked out from underneath them and he landed on his back. Suddenly, the kid was on top of him, a knee painfully pressed into the captain's chest and a hand around his throat, squeezing so tightly it almost closed off his windpipe. Suddenly, the boy didn't seem a boy at all. He seemed a whole lot bigger, a whole lot older. I said, this is a scythe action, and you will not intervene, or I will glean you right here, right now. The fire captain now knew he had made a grievous mistake. No one but a scythe could be so commanding and take absolute control of the situation. Yes, your honor, the captain rasped. I'm sorry, your honor. The scythe stood, letting the captain get up. He told his squad to fall back, and the squad, having seen the scythe take their captain down so effectively, didn't question it. You can protect other buildings that are threatened, the young scythe said, but you'll let this entire compound burn to the ground. I understand, Your Honor. Then the scythe held up his ring, and the captain kissed it with such force he cracked a tooth. Rowan felt his skin crawling beneath scythe Goddard's blood-soaked robe, but as unpleasant as it was, he needed to play the part. He was far more convincing than he thought he'd be. He frightened himself. The firefighters now directed all their attention to adjacent buildings, hosing down nearby roofs with fire retardant. Rowan found himself standing alone between the burning Tonist cloister and the crowd still held back by peace officers. He stayed until the steeple caved in <clears throat> and the giant fork at its apex plunged into the flames, resounding with a mournful clang as it hit the ground. I have become the monster of monsters, he thought, as he watched it all burn, the butcher of lions, the executioner of eagles. Then, trying not to trip over the robe, Rowan strode away from the all-consuming inferno that would leave nothing behind of Scythe Goddard and his disciples 
but bones too charred to ever be revived.